Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Polyhedron Cloud Cast, episode 152, sponsored by Kienda. I'm Steve Tudor. I'm Andy Lewis. I'm Sid Gill. And I'm Rory Summers, the most qualified painter of Polyhedron Collider. <laughs> Andy nearly Ladies lost his drink. I do, have to bit of a, I do have to bit of an audio descriptive at this point, because Andy was drinking his weak lemon drink at this point, and it nearly went absolutely everywhere. All <laughs> over my keyboard and everything. <laughs> what listeners also need to know is that behind Rory, in his virtual background, is his certificate. Because I've completed the fundamentals of painting as part of the Duncan Rhodes Painting Academy. Because I've been. Does that doing mean you want a paintbrush and some paint? Is that basically what that means? No, no. It means I've watched hours of great tutoring about the base, the fundamentals of miniature painting, and it's oh, actually been really does good. Does have a course? Yeah, it has a whole course. So it's like it's like four pound okay. ninety nine, three pound ninety nine. It's it is the cost of a fancy coffee, really. Um, so I've sat through not an avocado watched... smash on toast yeah exactly <laughs> cheaper than that so I sat down and listened and watched Dunk kind of talk me through painting and a lot of it I already knew but it was really nice to go back to basics and have someone talk me through and kind of the reasons for this and some of the techniques he uses so okay. I've done all that as, and that's all part of preparation for the, the painting competition we've got this year and then the extra one that Steve and I have decided to, um, because Steve and I don't have enough challenges, um, <laughs> we've decided to take part in the Corvus Belly Infinity painting competition, which which uh, is uh, is up next week. So by the time yes, this episode uh, comes out, we'll have like three days. What's the deadline for that? 16th, I think, August? yeah. 16th oh, August. poop on a stick. Right, I thought I had more time than that. No. No, so I've um, done one of my miniatures from Infinity Defiance. So I've done one of the ones from the Infinity Board game. Yeah, I'm regretting that decision because I forgot how detailed those miniatures are. Yeah, they are quite nice. I mean, I've got this one in front of me now, the one that you and I bought at the Expo, Steve. And yeah. it's, it is lovely. The detail on it is fantastic. Metal miniatures, it seems, have come a long way since the 90s when I last had some. Yes. So, we, yeah, we're doing that painting competition on top of the BG100 competition. Should we talk about the other painting competition and explain, or should we just leave that as a big surprise? Well, I think we should leave that as a big surprise. Right, leave that as a big surprise then. Okay, so that, that's a little teaser. We have no information to tease you, but yeah, there's something a bit bigger going on in the background at the moment. And Literally in my background as well. It's, it's just a... Here's the surprise. Oh my God, look <laughs> how organised Rory's background is at the moment. <laughs> What's up? But what do you expect? It's a minor Granger there, and you know, I'm mm, surprised he hasn't set that desk up with a set square and a plumb line. He I probably has, and he's got he's got tabs in his little ring binder. <laughs> Don't you get Sid excited now? I've got, my, I've got my clipboard of the he's episode one fifty two notes. <laughs> oh my god! He has actually got a clipboard. Good grief! There you go. <laughs> so that is oh, all dear. the interesting miniature painting news we've got to talk about in this episode. I finished Star Wars Imperial Assault. There we go. There Good we work, go. mate. Good work. <laughs> I know, yes. That, do you know what? It's taken me almost to the day two years to finish all of that. Really? Is that since you started painting or since you got the game? Uh, since I started painting the game. I've right, had the game okay. a little longer than that. Um, I got it. I actually bought Steve's copy for the yes, box set. my old copy, yeah. Yeah, the, the core box. But then I did a Lewis and uh, got literally all of the expansions. All of them. So there's six big boxes, uh, and there are for each little sort of wave, they release little miniature packs. So usually in the in the in the boxes, there'll be like little tokens that represent some of the the mm. characters you can have. So what FFG have done, um, obviously, is a cynical marketing exercise um, to <laughs> squeeze more money out of us um, idiots who are stupid enough to buy these things, namely me. Um, they'll release actual miniatures. Instead of you know to, to replace those tokens, so um, I've got all of those as well. So how many miniatures is that? Um, I don't know, but I'm I think well over a hundred. Oh, it's a metric. System. It is. It's, it's there, a lot. There are. I mean, your the pictures are beautiful, mate. I mean, there is some s- stunning work in there. Um, but Jesus, there's a lot of miniatures. There is, yeah. I mean, to be fair, I say it took me two years. Um, I did do Lord of the Rings in between all of that. I took a break, <laughs> and that took me a couple of months. But still, yes. Now, I'm particularly proud of um, of um, Lando Calrissian. His cape came out particularly well. Have you done all of Lord of the Rings as well? Yes, 
all of them. So in that time, you've actually painted all of Lord of the Rings Journeys of Middle Earth yes. with all the expansions. Yes. And all of Star Wars Imperial Assault with all the expansions. Yes. And wow. And wow. all of our competitions and some yeah. others as well. See, I'm really struggling to paint the five miniatures from Adrenaline. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I tried painting those a couple of years ago, and I'm not going to lie to you, they are bloody awful pictures. Yeah, I've actually they got really one on my painting are. handle right here. That <laughs> oh, God, the, yes, the yellow robot. You started with the hardest one. Painting yellow is never fun. <laughs> See, I, I reckon that's a knowledge which puts you at a disadvantage. Because, you know, when we, when we used, like, the two thin coats paints mm. at Aircon, mm. well, Amanda and Sue had to go, and Amanda just went straight up and picked the yellow. She just started painting this model in yellow and had no issue with it whatsoever because she, she was just, you know, no fear because she didn't realise yellow was difficult. Yeah, so she, she just painted with it. She didn't know what was impossible. So it becomes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it does depend on how they're prepared, to be fair. If yeah. you've got a black primer, you're in for a world of pain. <laughs> I think it did have a black it was a black primer. Oh, my goodness me. <laughs> and you know, right, well, and the it, coverage of that yellow paint might be quite good. It came out bloody nice. Okay, yeah. there you go. Well, well, since we've gone full circle on the Duncan Rhodes Two Thin Coats Painting Academy, shall we, which I think was an accident as well, guys. Well done. That's a round of applause for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, shall we crack on and talk about some board games that we've been playing? Because we've got a lot to cover. Because we've got a lot to cover. <laughs> You mean yes. you mean we've actually done our homework? Is we've done, yeah. There's been, there's been a lot of games being played at Collider Towers. What would you want? What, what, what would we start with then? God, what have you built? Because you and you and Steve have been kicking the back doors out of gaming at the moment, haven't you? Yes, like twice a week at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, I think we should start with Castellans because we played this with Sid. And yes. I think it's going to be an amusing way to start the episode. Oh dear, that's a bit ominous, isn't it? So, yes, <laughs> Castellans. Um, for we those need popcorn who... for this. Possibly, yes. Um, for those who are in the know, uh, Castellans is one of the Valeria games. Now, Valeria is a set of games, and I must admit, I've not played any Valerian uh, cards. I, I don't even know the other names in the in, in the in the system actually, but there's a whole bunch of games in the same setting, all with the same artist, which is uh, the Myco. Uh, it, it's mm -hmm. you know the typical name which he goes under. So it does look a little bit like a Chen Phillips game at first. This game is obviously part of a larger setting because within the box is a separate book which explains where this city is in the world and what each district and each guild does in the world. It's also got little stories. Yeah. It's like a D and it's like a yeah, role playing book. <laughs> it felt a little bit like that. So Castellans is a dice drafting area control game. Oh. And it's at its base, the principal core of the game is you will roll a chunk of dice and then you will draft them, gaining resources for the face you've picked. It's basically six different resources for the different actions on there. On the for the different dice. You then use those dice to take actions. There are six different actions. And if you use the dice matching the face of the dice, because you can do any action on your dice, but if you match the face, you also get another bonus, which is generally, it's not technically a reduction. You get, like, if you do the building action, you get an extra wood, but you're doing the building action spending wood, so it's effectively a reduction. So you are, of course, encouraged to, you know, utilise these dice effectively to both get the resources you need to, and and to reduce the cost of your actions. This... What you're mainly doing, sorry, sorry, Steve. Go on. It does. It sounds similar, not the same though, but similar to Tekenu. It's a lot more straightforward, I would say, than Tekenu. That's probably not hard. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so the main thing you're doing with these actions is basically putting pieces from your board onto the main board. So the city is made up of six different sections and there are five rounds in the game and each round of the game has got different sections get scored. So it's basically, it's, it's a standard area majority. Whoever has the most points worth of stuff in a, in a section of the city will score X points, second Y, third Z. And of course, I think we can, I think it plays up to five, maybe even six. But there are different buildings you can put down. It's not just about buildings. You can put buildings. The buildings going down allow you to 
um, give you bonuses on other actions. You've got temples that can go down, which take stone rather than wood. So you've got different resources. You've got ships you can build. Ships are really cool because you can actually spend actions to move them into the different quadrants of the city as well. You can build windmills that go in between two quadrants and give you half a point for each quadrant. You can also put workers in, and workers give you cards, which give you bonuses. And other, I think, they, other buildings give you bonuses for the number of people in there. You've also got special scoring buildings, which are a different colour, which score you based on particular characteristics that happen in a score, regardless of where you are on the board. Not just that, it's got some tracks in there as well, because it's not a modern Euro these days, we've had some tracks. <laughs> You've got four different guilds, and as you place buildings into the city, each district is linked to two guilds, and you'll go up the track in those two guilds. Usual rules, once your components, your little token goes over a certain line, you will get bonuses in resources or more money or ways in which you can go further up those tracks. And of course, you've got area control effectively at the end of the game for those tracks as well. Is this designed by Daniel Taschini, by chance? No. No, because if it was, it wouldn't be shit. <laughs> right. Well, there's well, the cards on the table right there. I, I was about to explain one other thing, which is also a buy and selling market, which is also an area control, because you can put your little stock marker on. You're right, Andy. It feels like a lot of games you've played before. Mm. It's definitely game deja vu. Okay. But it doesn't feel as complicated. Right. So it quite literally is pick a dice, place something on the board. You know, use that dice, spend the resources, put something on the board. You will be putting something on the board with every single action, with everything. Well, most dice, some dice will give you cash, but nearly every single dice you spend will put something on the board. And the important thing is about what you put where. Yes. And like you have to do things like if you unlock a certain building, it increases your warehouse capability, which means you can have more cash. Mm. Certain buildings, as I said, score every round rather than just in the three zones. And yeah, you can get points for this, points for that. But in the end of the day, it's all about just putting stuff down into these zones. Okay. And I'm going to preempt what Sid has already said <laughs> and say there's nothing actually wrong with the game. But it works well. Rulebook is well written, if a bit too wordy for my opinion. I think it could have been cut down by half the words. It's one of those things that says, like, well, it's one of those rulebooks that kind of says, rather than says, spend a die, put a building down, it's, it will say, like, take one die from there to here, oh. choose which building you want to play, pay the cost for that building, put it on the board. Place the dice the in your hands and cup your hands. Shake hands <laughs> vigorously. Uh, does it inform you at the very first step of setting up the game to put the board in the centre of the table oh. as well? <laughs> so a tape measure to make sure that it's right. You see, I feel like I'm being mean to this game, right? But I don't think we are. Because it is boring. I... <clears throat> I, well, well I, let's just let's just put, tell the tale let, here let, of let, how how this worked, right? So, Andy, you know, you have a bit of chat during the game. You end up talking about nonsense. You know, what did you yes, have for tea last night? Oh, I've had a tasty beers. You know, what was on TV? Well, we started having this kind of chat, and at one point, we realised we were about halfway through the game, and we'd been chatting for fifteen minutes, and no one had taken a turn. That is quite telling. And then, yes. and then I, I, I thought I would, you know, I thought I'd say it, lay myself my cards on the table and say, look. We're about three rounds in, I'm a bit... I feel like I've had enough. And Rory goes, I felt that a round ago. <laughs> wow, okay. But like and, as Steve uh, said, there's nothing wrong with this game. And I think I would describe this game as the forward focus of games, right? It does exactly the job, right? If you had, to, if you had like a courtesy car, right, and you just got... I've just got to get to and from work for a week while the car's in the garage. And you've got a forward focus. You'd be like, that will do. That will get me to and from work in relative comfort, relatively easy. It will just do. Am I excited about driving a Ford Focus? No, but it well, will do. I'm going to now reveal this... your uh, your lack of your self proclaimed lack of knowledge on cars, Mister. Because <laughs> I drive a Ford so, Focus. Man. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, driving a Ford Focus properly is quite a lot of fun. Really? I would suggest you're you're likening this game to a Volvo. Hey, no, I like a <laughs> Volvo. No, I've, New see, Volvos a Vol are very Volvo good. Old Volvos, get... the big, the big cardboard box ones. Well, they'll just and, plow and... through anything. You'll still get away with it. The, but it but see, boring. all those games 
create all those cars created a reaction. This doesn't. I'm I'm, I'm really sorry to say it was. We didn't even realise we were bored. That's how this. It just went weird. It was <laughs> for the first round. I was interested. It was quite. You know, poking it a little bit, moving some pieces around. Yeah, some we were stuff moving down. boats and it was a bit yeah, of competition. We were, Ooh, you were quite we're steal some points a from second, me there, you bastard. Second round, I started going, oh, I can't do half the stuff because it's, the market's screwed me. I can't dig myself up a hole because the dice have screwed me. Oh, okay, I'll just make, I'll just, all right, it might just be a round's worth of problems. All right, fair enough. Round three comes along. Oh, I'm being screwed by the dice again. I've been screwed by the market again. Well, where's my agency gone? Oh, you know what? Yeah. Let's talk about the paint drying on Steve's wall. Because look, there's a drip over there, Rory. That's more interesting than what, <laughs> what's going on here. And no, it's I... a real. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. But it. it it's. I don't know. I just. I, I just no, no, no. Lost my I, interest admit, in it. There's a story I didn't say at the time, or maybe I did. I can't remember. But of course, before we play, I've got to learn the rules, right? And there's a there's a thing we take the piss out of. Uh, a lot of RPG reviewers, because if you read RPG reviews, it's just a review of the book. Mm. They've never actually played the game. It's just a review of the book. I could have reviewed this game after reading the rule book mm. because I read that rule book, and I know there's the whole thing. If we play a lot of games, and I think most of our listeners do as well, so you get a good idea of what you like and what you don't like and how a game's going to work. I finished reading that rule book and went... I don't think I'm going to be surprised by this game at all. I think mm. I already know this game. And lo and behold, there were no surprises. <laughs> it worked exactly as I thought it was going to. The only interesting part in that game, in my opinion, were the windmills. The windmills were kind of <laughs> clever because it yeah. took me three rounds to work out what the hell they did. <laughs> but they were cl them clever or you stupid? But well, <laughs> man, look, it's all perspective, right? It's all about where you stand and look at the problem. Either way, though, they were tiebreakers. And yes. in a few occasions, right. they absolutely did their job as tiebreakers. Yeah, they, so they, if you had they a windmill in an area and nobody else did and there was a tie, you'd, it, you'd it, win. It yeah, because the, they, they the sit on the edge. On the border, <laughs> right. And they added, rather than adding one point to your like, area majority score, it was half a point. But it would score so it, the, it could score in either it's split between the yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So. so yeah, um unfortunately not much else exciting to say about Castle. Oh, it's it's very nice looking. Oh, it's very it's pretty. Look yeah. Yeah. It's it's looks very lovely. pretty. I've just pulled it up on BGG now. More actually to find out who designed it, who published it, to see if it was any of the um it's the daily magic suspects games. that would um, and it's nobody I've ever heard of, no. so I would also say as well, I opened the box because, of course, every board game you have to do a punching session. I was quite surprised I opened the box, took the shrink off it, ready to punch it, and realised that all the pieces were already in their game trays ready to play. That's nice. And I was like, oh, I've got nothing to do here. I just need to read the rule book and we're good. Sweet. But yeah, unfortunately, um, tepid is my thoughts on this. Moribund. More of, wow. What? Okay. That's a word. What yeah, word is that? You've just made I thought, that up. Uh, isn't that a type of hat? No. <laughs> that is not a type of hat. Moribund. You're thinking of cum a, cum a bun. That's the thing you put around your waist as part of a dinner jacket. <laughs> Was that a thing that holds your gut in? Because you, it, you yes. eat too much a, a big You've posh meal. You've got a on if you get to, a, to be a man of a certain age with a certain size. And this is exactly... Tie your, tie your gravy in. This is a great example of Castellans, right? It's, <laughs> rather than talk about Castellans, it's easier to just start making jokes about other things and we just yeah. slip away. <laughs> just slip away from talking about the game just as much as you slip away from playing it. It's a shame because it does look pretty. The artwork works nice the pieces are nice the presentation's all good but there's there's just nothing very exciting in that game have we got something more exciting to talk about well i was going to ask you cuz you you were all posting loads of uh, loads of little pictures on the the game that i missed mm -hmm. so i wanted to hear from you boys about sky team yes oh. cuz that is hot well, shit at the moment and everyone seems to be loving well it was hot shit Weeks and months ago, and I want to know why you lot were still super excited about it. Well, I can assure you, this is hot shit and deservedly so. Oh, well, there you go. Right, next. Absolutely <laughs> agree with that statement. It's such a simple game on paper. 
right? You are a flight crew landing a plane. Yeah. Pilot, co-pilot. And you've got four dice, and it's a dice placement game. You roll the dice, you place them on, on your little board, right? And the dice re- represent things like airspeed, uh, so the engine speed, sorry. Um, you, you, your you're flaps. Leveling. Yeah. Your, 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 your artificial horizon, your flap deployment, your undercarriage deployment, your brakes deployment, and then you've got to clear, you've got someone's got to radio ahead to clear the flight path. And then if you want as well, you can spend dice on brewing a cup of coffee because that can be used to uh, adjust dice if you haven't got what you want. But the really important thing is you can't talk to each other as you play. Huh? Yeah, so so to give you a yeah. really good example of this is <laughs> that the leveling of the aircraft, right? At the, the game, the, the aircraft starts level. If Rory puts a three in and I put a two, well, then the plane shifts to the left slightly. Makes sense. It shifts by one. It, it oh, I can see how this section. goes wrong. I, yeah, I can fat see people that. move to one side of the plane. <laughs> Another example is the speed of the plane is determined by the summation of the two dice you place down. So you always have to place your levelling dice and you always have to place your engine dice. So the speed is determined by the summation of the two dice, but it falls between two bands. So the the pilot's lower in the undercarriage, which slows the aircraft down, but the co-pilot's like levelling up the flaps, which speeds the airplane up. So this puts like an upper and lower band. So if the summation is below this band completely, you don't move. In between them, you move one space forward. And above the two, then you move two spaces forward. That but you've got to make sure... That might be idea, because you might hit the that might, runway. Well, you, well, you might hit another aeroplane or that's already in the air. Yeah. <laughs> or, or in the flight you path, might, right, don't you? Yeah, or, or as you said, you might overshoot the runway. So you have to make sure that you hit the runway at the right level. And the turn marker is your altitude. So as you're going down, every round, you're going down another 1,000 feet. No. See it? So you have you. to time it exactly. I'm getting flashbacks here of Die Hard 2. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got guy? more airplane when like the the, the blow up man pops up out of the chair next to old Leslie. <laughs> it, it just is, sounds nuts. It, it sounds absolutely game, bonkers. You, yeah, you've got these two little dice shields. You've got to roll your dice. So between the rounds, you're allowed to discuss roughly what you hope to achieve. But then you go right. Okay, so I think I think I'm going to concentrate on clearing our flight path. That's what I'm going to try and do this round. But this is before I've rolled any dice. And you're not allowed to talk about, I'm going to put my highest dice here. You're not allowed to mention the dice at all. I'm going to I'm going to focus on clearing the flight path because that's really important. So then you roll your dice and then it's silence, except for, you bastard. Oh, why'd you, <laughs> why'd you put that? Oh. And that is... So it's, <laughs> it's almost an antagonistic co-op. <laughs> It is such a tense game. It is so tense. It's so interesting. It's so exciting. It's so innovative. It's very Mm. different. See, when I first saw it, I Mm. thought it it looked a bit reminiscent of Falling Skies. No. But it's obviously nothing like that. No. (coughs) No, nothing nothing like that. I don't even have to know what Falling Skies is to know that Sky Team (laughs) is is very unique. (laughs) There's nothing like it. But we, we finished our first game and we lost. So we was like, right, we've got to, we've got to do this again. Straight up, doing this again. Right, so reset, just oh. go again. So we, we kicked off and then we won the next game. I was like, right, okay, let's see what's else. In the, let's, should, we, should we play again? I was like, well, what? Are we just going to do the same thing? No, there's a whole flight log. So it's different missions. And these come with different airports to land at. And then they add a whole new raft of rules. Like but a chop, the, uh, yeah, yeah, nice. quite literally, yes. You've got you've <laughs> nice. got you start That's worrying what... about your fuel, and you've got uh, you've got uh, a trainee pilot that you've got to work on as well. I can't remember the other ones. Then you've got random planes um, that appear. Yeah, so when we we played London because each one is actually themed after a real airport. So we did uh, it's. it's Montreal is the default one, yep. isn't it? So then we did London Heathrow. So London Heathrow is supposed to be really busy. So mm. random planes appear. So you think the flight plaf's clear, and all of a sudden more planes appear at random places. Um, <laughs> Some jackass doing the Red Bull challenge zooms in. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> but, but you say there's chop, there's side winds, nice. and there's like there's, there's ones where like you know we were saying you've got to kind of try and get the plane level. Mm. There's ones where you have to tilt for certain areas on the map before you get there, yeah. so you have to try and move to the right, then level, then go to the left. It is a fantastic game, and this game was twenty three pounds from a, from our sponsor, from our show sponsor, Kienda. This was an absolutely belting game. This is well within punt territory. And if you are ever in a situation where you go, you play a lot of games two player, then this is one that you absolutely need to have on your shelf. For 23 quid, that's cheaper than a takeaway for two people. And you will have more fun doing this. And you'll probably, if you've got Sky Teams instead of a takeaway, you'd probably play it over and over and over again, you get so wrapped up in that excitement and that drama and that tension, you'd forget to eat. <laughs> so that's the problem I've had, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> I've, 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 the the passion, the passion over this is 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 immense. We only stopped playing Sid because we have other games to review. <laughs> yeah, I, I, we could have quite. I could have happily played that all afternoon and, and burnt through that. Um, flight yeah. log and tried all the different modules and all the different options. Very, it very sounds happy like to Microsoft do. Flight Simulator, the board game. It really does. No, no, it's better than that. It's better than that. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Microsoft Flight Simulator is very good. Oh, that makes me sound very, very boring, but it's really good. <laughs> you should go play some Castellans, I think. <laughs> That'll bring you back down to work for the <laughs> crash. And, but <laughs> it's a small box. It doesn't take up a lot of space on the table. You could pl- easily play this on one of those small, round, stupid round tables in the pub. Could you play it on a plane? You absolutely could play this on a plane. You could play this on one of those little drop-down tables. Y- you could, but you might get looks when you go, oh, my God, we've crashed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> air breaks, air the breaks. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, See, Alora and I have been like keeping an eye out for like, some decent two-player games because obviously we play, a f- well, we do play a lot of Sky games. Sky Team, players, just buy so. it. Buy it, thank me um, later. Fine, done. Sir, yes, sir. <laughs> done. <laughs> Right, well, on that bombshell, I'm not sure I can take any more of this passion-loving... Well, well we um, should probably say we did get that from our sponsor, Kienda. Yeah. Um, so if you fancy getting yourself a board game such as Sky Team, there will be a link in the show notes. Yeah. And uh, you get a taste of that discount. Is excitement guaranteed? If you buy Sky Team, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Less so for Castellans. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, and, and less so... No, that's a, that's a horrible thing to start this review with. Uh, no, no, go for it, because I entirely agree with you if it's the game I'm thinking of. <gasps> oh, it wasn't, oh, but I think we should talk about that now. I think we should talk about the other one it. instead. Let's do it. <laughs> Which one are you... Oh, I'm confused by what... But let's... Right. We're now going to talk about Maps of Miss Terror from Sit Down Games, right? So this was a review copy sent to us by the publisher, and we've played this all. Uh, I don't think you've played this, have you, Sid? No, I haven't played this one. No. So Maps of Mysteria is a game about island cartography where you and your fellow explorers, cartographers, you're going to venture off into this island to discover the mysteries and record them down on your little player boards, which brilliantly are shaped like clipboards. Um, But uh, since everybody's discovering this island at the same time, there's an element in this game of collaboration and competition. As you're collectively building up this central map that's in the middle of the table, um, but everyone's trying to map that island according to a very specific kind of um, objective that they've been given. So in the centre of the table, you've got this map, this island, which is a five by five grid of squares. Uh, you've got a few starting forests on there, but then each player has got their own uh, little board and your own objectives. And you're going to move your cartographer. Then you're going to sketch what you can see, and then you'll move, and then you'll sketch some more, and then you'll just keep doing that round and round and round. So you've got these little sketch cards, which is a two by one card, which dictates, which denotes a type of terrain. So when you go, right, I'm here, and I'm going to grab those terrain tiles and add them to the central map, but they are unconfirmed islands. So it's kind of like, I think there's a forest here, but I'm not quite sure. So in your subsequent turns, or another player can come along, and if they agree that there is a forest there because they've selected a tile and placed it on their board, you take the forest tile and you flip it over to its confirmed state. But the interesting, the other interesting thing they can do is they can come along and go, actually, no, it's not forest, Rory. That's actually a mountain. And you take you your forest You were drunk off, when you wrote that down. <laughs> and a mountain goes on the board instead because that's what Andy wants to do. Andy wants to have lots of mountains. 
So it's, I like to think of this as a kind of like, I've said there's a forest there, but it needs to be peer reviewed by somebody else. You need a second vote of confidence on that. So you're, but I'm trying to build the map, as I said, from my two objective cards. So I want a particular configuration of forests or mountains, or I want these things in this order. And you're trying to do this. So we're going around manipulating as much as possible what everybody else is doing on this central map. You've then got the fact that you can claim certain areas, which is, I think, so once you've got a confirmed area, you're going to go and state your flag in this forest or this mountain or in this lagoon and say, this is mine. I'm then going to score points for how big this lagoon is at the end of the game. So this is kind of like naming something after you, the Forest of Rory or the Tudor Lagoon, or as I like to say when I played with Andy, the Andes for the mountain range, which was a... <laughs> <laughs> so, and then the game ends once the whole map this whole central map has got all confirmed tiles at which point you're going to score points based on how closely your clipboard map resembles this central map and whoever's done the best at that and has met the their objectives by having this size that or this shape whatever and has claimed the biggest areas is going to be score, under, score the points and win the game and that, in a nutshell, I don't think I've missed anything now. No, no, no. no. Happy with that? Oh, you lose you lose points for not filling your map. Oh, that's yeah, a minor yeah. One. If you've been lazy yeah. and not got around the island. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, depending on which terrain type you're in, changes what you can do. So, if you're on a mountain, yeah. you can see further, which means you can sketch further away. If you're in a forest, you can't sketch at all because you can't see anything. If you're on one of the steps, because it's there's no obstructions, you could carry on moving. Uh, the lagoons, you get to cipher, shift through the um, the sketch cards to get new ones out. That is the game in itself. Why does it feel like there's a butt coming? Because there is. No, there isn't a now. butt. <laughs> no, there isn't. I, the, there's dissenting opinion. No, I, 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 I'm going to be with Rory on this one. I think this game's really clever. Mm. But... We played this a few times uh, on our Monday night session with our friend Adam. Adam didn't get this game at all. He could not get his head around it. And we played loads of games on Board Game Arena as well. And I don't know why, because I got this, and I think this game's really clever. And it reminds me, actually, of Sit Down Games' previous game, Tiwanaku. Yeah. I think, although they're very different mechanics, they feel as if they've come out of a similar brain, if that makes sense. And I think that's why you don't like it, Andy. Because you didn't really like Tiwanaku either. That does explain a lot, actually. I didn't know it was the same people. Mm. That does explain mm. quite a lot. Um, I will say that it is mostly beige, and that is very appropriate. <laughs> no, it's not mostly beige. <laughs> the forest it is, of bright the green. Are beige. No, no, I don't. <clears throat> I know, I, I, I agree. I know what Andy means basically because the unconfirmed tiles have got clouds over yeah. the top, haven't they? Yeah. So it, it does desaturate it a bit and take a lot of the colour out of this game. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think this is a clever and quite rather original game, personally, and I really enjoyed this. Yeah. I think there is, it's relatively quick. Mm. Um, half an hour tops. I mean, what, half an hour tops, mm, yeah. yeah. You're, because you're getting different secret objectives every game, it means what you're trying to do every game is slightly different. Although I do think trying to fill your map and match it to the main map is actually a priority and scores you more points in the yeah. end. Definitely did an um, argument with Rory. Mm, he absolutely yeah. thrashed me because he explored the whole map and I explored about two thirds of it. Mine was slightly mm. more accurate, but because I had empty spaces, I got pumped on points. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think the area control thing, that it, it's it's one of the reasons why I struggle a bit with Carcassonne. I know it's an, an old throwback, that one, but farmers in Carcassonne can really win the game. And I think area control in this, and we mostly played it three-player, me and you, yeah. Rory, haven't we? And I find with more players, this game gets more difficult because people are getting in your way and changing things and putting things down that you don't want to be there. Yeah. So there's a lot of to and throwing and trying to get those claim markers down was really difficult. So I'm intrigued what it's like at four because we never actually get we to play it no. at four player. But that's a great thought. When you claim an area, well, the really interesting mechanic here, so I can claim this forest and Steve can claim that forest. So I'm gonna, we're both going to score points for how big the forest is. But if Andy, if you're able to come along and connect these two forests up with another forest tile, all of a sudden, because Steve and I can't both, the forest can't both be called Steve and be called Rory, neither of us score points, and we lose all of those points. We don't get a negative, 
But that's just all of those. And we've lost one of our claim markers, which means we, that's one less thing we can claim. It makes, and I think, I think the player interaction in this game is really interesting because it's a little bit passive aggressive. It's not direct. So I'm not fighting you, but I think when I, one, one game I played with Steve, I just sent my cartographer, I just followed him. So Steve was walking up the side of the map and I was just walking behind him, confirming just stuff and then it. claiming it. No, I was confirming <laughs> it. I was just saying, oh. yes, that is a mountain. You're right. Brilliant. Move on. That's also a mountain. I'm going to claim it. This is now going to be called the Rory Range. And just followed Steve all around the map and it really pissed him off. But I got a lot of points. <laughs> It was really freaking annoying. But it was just like, but it's not overly aggressive. It's just, and there was nothing, and all he had to do, he had to start putting step tiles down to just try and run away from me. But it was interesting. Yeah, which was the the other strategy, thinking ahead about the special bonus ability you get off each, um, off each tile, meant that, yeah, I had to place tiles a bit more tactically, not just what I wanted to score the points at the end, but to try and get you to do something rather than just claim everything I was putting down. Yeah. I think it's a really elegant game. I think it's really interesting. Um, but I understand that it, it really isn't everyone's cup of tea. No. I It just did not grip me at all. Mm. It's functional, but I, don't, I didn't find it exciting in any way, shape or form. It works. It did its job. I, I will admit it took me a little while to get my head round the mapping and the confirming bit. Once I got my head around, I was like, oh, okay, fine. What else do we do? Oh, nothing. Oh, right, okay. Um, so, again, I think it makes... The fact that it's been made by the same guys who did Tuanaku, I think, because, again, as Sid said in that review, I've seen everything it can do now, and therefore I've checked out. I mean, I I don't think you ha have. I think I remember, like, the first game, the, the first game we played is now very different to the games we've been playing lately because we are we've Steve and I have developed this I wouldn't say a meta per se but I'm finding the game a lot more tactically rich now because I understand more about how the game works and what I'm going to try and do I the thing is it must be fairly good right because you've kept going back to it hmm so mm. there must be something in there, even if you can't quite put your finger on it, that's pulling you back into playing it, because you have played a lot of games of it. It, it is a, it's relatively light. As I said, it's relatively quick. So you know, an in-person game, half an hour. It's not complex. It's you know, it, it's really is quite simple. Mm. Move, put down, move, put down a tile, move, put down a tile, mm -hmm. and then occasionally you can you can claim something. And I just I do think it's got a nice little balance. I think it has this very much a case of it. You've got a nice little puzzle that isn't an overly complicated euro that's going to melt your brain, but at the same time is done relatively quickly as well. So if you do screw up, mm. well, it's not too long until the next one. Yeah. And that so puzzle I, is I really do... interactive with all the different players. You can be playing mm. your own little thing, trying to do this thing, and someone else can just charge in and mess it up, not deliberately, or rather not to cause you strife, but they're doing it as part of their... Yeah, they can well. do that. But they're probably more likely to do it as part of their own agenda. And that's, I think that's another similarity between Tiwanaku and Maps of Mystery. They've both got this central board that everybody's working on at the same time, but to their own ends. I would actually say, if, if you liked Tiwanaku, I'd highly recommend looking... At Maps, Maps of Mysteria, but based on Andy's response, if you didn't like Two and Aku, probably don't bother. I would agree with that. I don't hate it, it's not a terrible game, don't get me wrong. I've played far mm. worse in my time, I just didn't find it exciting. It, it sounds like to me it's an either the end of the night wind down game when you all want to go home, or when you just want to do something of a, of a quiet evening. Mm. It, is, it is a lot more relaxed, it's a lot more chilled out in mm. what you do you know it's it's mm. it's not cutthroat it's not aggressive it's not in your face it is not beige but it's a subdued game it's quite interesting because some of the same same language we're using here is the same language used for castellans and we didn't like that What's the money? What's the money? Says I quite enjoy Catalans. Well, that's what I'm wondering. You see, that's what I'm wondering here because we're we're using words like beige and it's it's 
calm and it's peaceful and it does everything it's supposed to do. It's almost the same vocabulary, but in this case, it's you positive. guys have come out with a positive game. Yeah, Castlands was two hours. Maybe that's what and it was. We checked, and we checked out after about an hour. This is half an hour. So maybe it's just the length of, of Castlelands yeah, then. I'd, I'd say more than that. I'd say Maps and Mysteria is actually just, it's more interesting. Okay. It's more interesting. It's more interactive. Like when we play Castlelands, like, okay, it's just that, that area control, that's the only way we're interacting. But Maps of Mysteria, you're almost always interacting because you're always feeding. This, this, this island at the beginning of the game is empty. There's nothing there. So everything you do, Sid, forwards the game somehow. You have shaped that terrain. You've shaped the island somehow. And I can come in along and interact with that positively, negatively, or I can go off on my own thing. But what you've done is still contributing to what we are doing. I think, I, I think, I think basically what we're seeing here is Andy needs to play Castellans. And I need to play Maps of Mysteria. And then we can have a, a reconvening of the forum. <laughs> yeah. That's Maps of Mysteria. Well, I'm going to go for one of our cheesy links here. Do you know what else uses maps? Pirates. <laughs> I think he was talking about some pirate pirates. pirates. Now, now, really, the game we should be talking about is Port Royale, the dice game. But it's worth mentioning Port Royale because Royal. the dice game, I, Port Royal. Yeah, Port Royal. I, I, Googled, Port Royal. I Googled it earlier to make sure we were pronouncing it right. Oh, it's Port Royal. I've been pronouncing it Port Royale for fucking yeah, years. It's so Port, Port, Royal. It's Port Royal. That is why I've corrected Port your Royal. notes. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Port Royal, then. <laughs> and so Port Royal is a push-your-luck pirate-themed game. Mm-hmm. And you've got this, haven't you, Andy? So you've played this. I assume you've played this quite a bit. Uh, yes. Paul yeah. Royal, the, the so, original card game, yes. The, the original card game, yeah. So it's it's quite an old game, 10, maybe 15 years old, I think. Mm. It's really simple. Big deck of cards. You draw cards, and some cards will be ships, which can give you money, uh, and other cards are basically pirates, which you buy. And the pirates give you special abilities, but they also have victory points on them. And when you somebody reaches 20 victory points, end the game. Boom. Oh, There's also so you can spend the money. Yes, they are double sided. Not. Yes, yes. So the yeah, the money is a, that's, that's a the clever thing. Yeah, mm. yeah. So the, when you have it face down, it's gold. Face up, it's the card. That's it, There's yes. also. There's also expeditions, which if you have certain tokens, you can win. But it's push your luck, because if you draw two ships of the same color, you bust, and basically your entire got turn is gone. Um, you can limit this slightly because if you have cutlasses on your special ability, your pirates. Then, if you have a certain amount of cutlasses, you can repel some of these ships and basically discard it, so you can carry on playing and carry on drawing cards. It's an older game, but it still works. It stands up. Really, it stands really, up really, really well. And it's it's the same designer who did um, Great Western Trail, is it not? Yes, is it? it is. Yeah, Alexander Fister. It is. Which yeah. I was I was stunned when I learned that the first time. I was like, oh my god, it's the it's the great it's the cow guy. The cow guy. Guy. <laughs> Absolutely, and again, one of those games takes fifteen minutes tops. Yes. Yeah. So it's yeah, quick. You, it's, it's like you keep that. We're going to keep that in reserve for the end of the night when you've finished a bit early and you want to whack another game in, and will cause you to swear as you go bust mm-hmm. and call someone a bastard for pulling all like six brilliant ships and not getting a double colour once. Absolutely brilliant. Port Royal, the dice game, takes the same basic principle but kinds of in turns it into a not quite roll and write. Yeah. Ooh. I, I say not quite roll and write because you are fundamentally writing on a piece of paper like you would a roll and write. Mm-hmm. But it still uses the bust system. So what it does is instead you roll two dice which represent a colour of ship and a location. Yeah. For better once for a better word. And you put them onto a grid. You have this little table little Excel spreadsheet in front of you where you quite literally go the black C. So you put the black ship on column C. And then you roll the dice again and you might get orange A. So you put the orange dice on column A. Some of them will give you um like captain's wheels as well, yeah. ship's wheels, which you put down which are always towards the right. So they're always like EF. But if you roll the same ship twice 
you bust. Exactly the same way as Port Royal, the card game. So if I've rolled that black C, and I then roll a black B, well then bust, and I have to take a skull, which means crossing off one of the skulls on my sheet of paper, but you do cross off some stuff. You then take ships, depending on which ship you get, determines how many little circles you can cross off on your little sheet. And crossing off sheets unlocks islands, which usually gives you a bonus, treasures, pirates, all kinds of things. And there's four different maps mm-hmm. to work with, four different sheets. So it's kind of like a roll and write, in that you're doing rolling and writing, but it's also push your luck. I also forgot to say as well, you take a, a number of these tokens off, which you then score, you then go around the table and everyone then takes another thing off. Oh. Uh, the wheels activate special abilities, the ships will unlock a certain number of crosses, but you also get um, these skulls, skull and crossbones, where when you get a certain amount of them, you start losing points. And it's like quite constant, so every two you lose a point. Right, okay. Right. So far... So simple. First person to 20 wins. No, well. However. Well. However, <laughs> there is a sudden death rule, which is there are, when you're, the score sheet is another little map with ships going onto islands. And when you get to certain islands, there are sudden death rules where as if it's your turn and you're on that score, if you get a certain number of icons on the, on the little map, so map these, these little ship tokens and little wheel tokens, you win the game instantly. Oh, yes, a sudden death in a push your luck game. So basically, the, you're pushing your luck because the chances are you could go bust and not do it, but and the, the higher your score, the easier it is to do this because it goes like, I think, seven, six, five, four. So once you get to four, someone has to shoot up and try and score the points to win. Also, the four different maps introduce some slightly different rules, so different mechanics work in different ways. You have quests and diplomats and gunners, so they just they are like just a variation on the core rules. You also get sailors, which have, which have crossed swords, so you can re-roll some dice in much the same way as in the card game. You could discard, you know, you could discard a ship with you've got cutlasses, and it, it, it uses it uses yeah. all the same iconography as well, and all the same names. So, but as Steve said, get to twenty points and you win, or as we've done in a couple of games that we've played, I'll get to eighteen, and then Steve will just win. <laughs> I've won every game with the lowest score because of sudden death. Because every time I've got to the point where Rory's on 18 or 19 points, I've just pushed my luck and triggered the sudden <laughs> death rule. Which, and it, it's, it introduces probably the most interesting choice of this game. It's, do I flip the table or punch him in the nose? <laughs> Both. <laughs> flip the table to punch him in the nose. <laughs> it is... We talk about we talk about when we talk about these games. We talk about like whether they elicit an emotion, whether they elicit a feeling, mm-hmm. or um, violence. Port Royal, Port <laughs> Royal, the dice game does elicit an emotion in me every time I play it. But it is an emotion I do not want, and it is just sheer, <laughs> utter frustration. And that frustration just builds throughout the game. No, yeah, it's not just a sudden death. This is isn't it? because in Port Royal, you've got there is some de- Port Royal, Port Royal, sorry, Port Royal. There is, <laughs> it's there. Are, there is, although it's random, it's a deck of cards. There is some deterministics you can do. You go, actually, we've had a, quite a few blue ships come out now. So there's another bit. I can push my luck because I don't think there's enough blue ships left in this deck now. And you can, and you also have information on the cards, isn't it? It says how many blue ships are actually in the deck when you look at the blue yes. ship card. So, it, so you can kind of go, oh, we've had three, and there's only there's five in the five, deck. Yes. And this is the third one. This is so that's third a big one. pile of cards. So, yes, yeah. we're all right. One hundred percent chance of drawing. <laughs> yeah, as soon as you think about it. Yeah, of course. But with the dice game, I can roll, you know, blue C. I pick the dice up again, and I can roll blue C. It's just there's, From a purely statistical point of view, your chance of getting blue sea again are exactly the same as getting anything else, and it's just anything else. D sixes, I assume. Yeah, D sixes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
so yeah there are six colors and i think there's actually only five locations but anyway there's um and that is so frustrating where and we had this we played it again last night and the first few rounds each of us were just going bust really really quickly really really early and it's just like i've done nothing to deserve this punishment because all I'm trying to do, I'm just trying to roll these dice three times to get something, to do something. Because you've got to roll at least three. You've got to get at least three tokens you, on this map no, to no. take one action. No, 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 no. You've got to take at least three to not take a Connected, skull when you yeah. take an action. But then at that point, it doesn't matter because the penalty for being bust is taking a skull. Yeah. So it almost makes that... Moot. Pointless. Yeah. You might as well always try and get three because you're always going to take one skull otherwise. So you're rolling Especially these... Especially early in the game where you don't need a particular colour. You just want to... Yeah. So you're rolling these dice. I've got to do it three times. Oh, look, I'm bust. And there were even times in a three-player game where Steve would roll it once and then he'd roll it again and go bust. So he takes a penalty. Adam's the next player. So Adam gets to take the one ship that's on the board. And I get bugger all I'm like well that's it's just unfair it's just and that frustration perpetuates through the game there are some maps where you need particular colours so I need can, a can yellow can I point to the biggest can I point towards the biggest frustration oh there's a bigger one I think there's a bigger one Andy how long does Port Royal take to play <laughs> uh, I don't know half an hour 45 minutes. Half an hour? Yeah, I'd say so. You think that long? It, oh, I, mean, okay. it, I mean, the deck's pretty big, and if you, you can go through it a couple of times. But how does the turn take? Oh, I don't know. 30 seconds? Two minutes? Yeah. A minute tops? Be because you just your cards. You're rolling dice constantly. So it's roll dice, apply the result. Roll dice, apply the result. Roll dice, apply the result. So it takes longer for the game to actually play. Mm. With less going on. With less uh. going on. And it's weird. It's I realised it like halfway through the first game. It was suddenly like, hang on, Port Royal works really quick because you just draw draw some cards. Oh, and bust. Oh, oh yes, I love them. Yeah. Next player. It's constantly churning. It's constantly going around. Most of this time, you're spending watching somebody roll some dice and then go, oh, bust. And then moving all these tokens. You gotta, when you roll the dice, you've got to move a token onto the board to represent what you've just rolled. Right. So there's also a lot of faffing of moving the tokens around. Mm. It just that would frustrated me more than the gameplay. I think because the, the the time between excitement was longer. That's a really good way of looking at it because there are points in that game where it is quite interesting. And we talked about my frustration when you beat me last night is a great example. For me, mm. that was there was a level of tension for me watching you roll. There's a fourth one. There's a fifth one. If he does the next one, he's won. And that is dramatic. And for you, I can imagine it is also quite dramatic. I just need one more. I just need one more. But the if that didn't work, there's so much time between those excitements. There's just like, oh, it didn't work. Yeah. Next. And it just feels really flat between. Where is your influence as a player in this game? What are you impacting on the game? So there's two, there's two things. The actual pushy look thing of when to keep rolling and when to stop. Yeah. So the more you roll, the more options you'll have and potentially the more rewards you'll get. Because if you get enough symbols on the board, then you can take more things off, allowing you to do more things. The other thing is the map on the board. So you're crossing things off because it's effectively a roll and write. You're crossing areas off the map and you have lots of choices about where you go. Yeah. And I must admit, we were playing like this three-player last night Everyone did things in a completely different order. It wasn't like everyone had picked an optimised route through the map and done the same thing. So where you go on the map is is a big deal about what you mm. do. Do you go for the spaces that give you a bonus every time you pick a yellow token? Do you try and get the cutlasses to try and re-roll? Do you just go for the points and go for the treasure chest? That kind of thing. But ultimately, you are entirely at the behest of chance because yes. you're rolling those dice. Not only that, though... But I'm at the behest of chance. So if Steve's rolling dice, Steve will take the best result. And then then you will take the next best result. So then I'm left with whatever's there. So I don't have any choice, really, at all. When it's not your when turn. When it's not my turn, which is yeah. two-thirds of the game. 
mm. I get even I get even less choice. Yeah, I can see the frustration in this one. It feels like you'd be a passenger along the ride for this game, of the dice doing whatever they do. Yeah, when it's not your turn, yeah. it is very passive. Mm. And it can feel like, especially if you go bust and then someone else goes bust, which means you don't get a dice, it can sometimes feel like nothing happens in a full cycle, mm. like Rory alluded to earlier. So, it, yeah, and whereas, like I said, actual Port Royal, the card game, the original game, the churn's quite quick, so mm. that time between you doing fun things, and if you go bust, it's like, ah, oh, I've gone bust, boom, okay, we've gone. But Is that the problem here, then? Is the problem here that you've played a different variant of the same game and you can't shift that? That is what you're likening it to now. It sounds like a less optimised version of the same game. They've added yeah. faff. Yes, I agree. Mm. And but, but come back to your point, Sid. It's hard to say mm. because it is an iteration of this game. You, it's not. Mm. It's it, it's not a random game. If this was called, I don't know, Pirates of Palooza or something like that, would we have the same feeling about it? Well, probably, yeah. But we wouldn't have that. We wouldn't have that bar. Point. Yeah. You wouldn't be comparing it to yeah. Port Royal because yeah, this is but Port Royal, but we. It's the same. It's the same out. publisher. It's the same designer. It's the same name yeah. it's not just some random game that's been churned out it's supposed to be an iteration of this it sounds like it's along the Who's same getting... lines as um terribly boring farce Ares expedition i think you're the only one's played that ah like, oh, yes i know i think you should all play it actually um because that is an iteration of the say of the same game the mechanics are very slightly hmm. different because it becomes a, a simultaneous game rather than a, a one after the other game um, but there's entirely the stuff in there that becomes frustrating, like because it's a simultaneous game. If you're playing quite a quick game, and there's a slow player, you're just sat there with your thumb up your ass until they decide what the <laughs> hell they're doing, and that's quite frustrating. Mm. And there's a bunch of stuff in there that doesn't need to be there, and it it just seems like it's a twist on the game that just doesn't need to be there. Okay, all right. Well, taking on board what everybody said, then who is this game for? That's exactly it the ain't, question. It ain't for the people that liked Port Royal because they'll just play Port Royal. Is it for new people? Is it trying to bring <sighs> different folk onto the I think franchise? In some ways, it's What's quite, it doing? It's a quite interesting variant on the roll and write. I think that in itself, if you like roll and write games, this is a this is a very this is similar, but it's different. It's doing something interesting with that roll and write mechanic. So that's probably who it's aimed at. That that that's an interesting thing. We're we're using Port Royal the card game as a baseline, mm. and so we don't like this game. But if you use Roll and Rights, which we as a group generally don't like as a baseline, it comes out not bad because it's got the, the push you look as an interesting. It's it it trying to hide into nothing, isn't it? Really, <laughs> with us four. <laughs> We've had a funny old list of games this week, haven't we? We have indeed. Anyway, I think don't buy Port Royal the dice game. Go buy Port Royal the original card game. Unless you like Roll and Rights, in which case, go and buy it's Port Royal the dice game. Yeah, yeah, give it. Give, if you like Roll and Rights, give this a punt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You probably really, if, actually, if you like Roll and Rights, there is a lot. There is a lot to like here. Yeah, but for us, no. Right then, gents, we've got a bit of time left. I think we should answer some questions because we haven't done questions in a long time. Oh, I like questions. Oh, that's a surprise. So, it is a right. surprise. I thought I'd wing it on you. So, really, to really surprise her, I'm going to get Sid to pick a question. <laughs> do, 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 do. Put him on the spot. Hang on, I need, I need to put my big glasses on for this. <laughs> we are of a certain age, aren't we? <laughs> I need a different set of glasses so I can read that bit. This <laughs> tongue, week. Out, tongue out the side, all on the glasses to, ch to change the focal length. You all speak for yourselves. My eyesight's twenty twenty. Yeah, it'll catch up. I am speaking for myself. Mate. I've been in four pairs of glasses soon. Different focal <laughs> lens. It's ridiculous. You'd be doing this a lot soon as well. What have you got? I already super am. Super short range, short range, medium range, and long range. <laughs> well, no, I, I'm seriously thinking about buying a pair of glasses just for miniature painting. Oh, God. Big, wow. Big ones. I had to, <laughs> yeah, I had to buy a pair of these short, short, short the other range. day, the, the little magnifying scope light ones. There's just no way. I can't see this miniature I'm painting. I can't <laughs> see it. I, it wasn't until I pull up a the lowest level magnifier on these glasses. I was like, bloody hell, there's all this design on her legs. 
I, well, I did that with the um, the butcher from Kingdom Death. I remember looking at a YouTube, uh, not YouTube, Reddit post. Somebody pointed the kit, the butcher, and I went, "Wow, that detail isn't on my model." <laughs> oh wait! So I went back to my model, <laughs> got a magnifying glass, went, "Oh shit, it is. Look at that." <laughs> Oh, right. Dear. How controversial do we want to go? Go on, let's go What's big. you said, so maximum controversy. Well, as as has put a good one in, which is going to stir the pot okay. up. Um, oh, wow, yes. So as Johnson asks us, is the use of AI good or bad for this industry? He also then caveats his question, saying that this will fill up a few episodes. <laughs> <laughs> is, is this a question that we get out our 10-foot barge poles and don't touch it? <laughs> well, I, I think, collectively, we can probably answer this really quickly and move on. Probably, yeah. I think we're more or less of the same ilk, aren't we? Mm. So AI for art, I think we all agree, is not a good thing. For any I industry, yep. let alone this except, one. Yeah. Except for the polyhedron colliders, what is it Wednesday social media post, in which case yeah, the AI a, that, is brilliant for it. But we're not but making you're using money for that. that. In a, you're <laughs> no. not making money for it. You're using it in a satirical way. I am. It's a perfectly acceptable way of using it. It's quite a good idea, actually. Some of them are quite hard. <laughs> yeah, some of them are really hard. Um, now... What I don't know, because I'm I'm not fully up on AI, so I don't know how useful it will be for... I wouldn't like to see a rule book written by AI either. Good grief, and no. that's going to happen. That's going to happen. We're going to see an AI rule book before long. But I wonder how useful it's going to be for game development before you write the rule book and things like that. You know, write your test rule book or something like that. Game testing might be quite good for it. Because yeah, you can run through a lot more iterations on the computer than you can with a bunch of humans. Yeah. It's a, t- now, it's a tool, do right? I don't know. It's a tool. Yeah. I'm, it's like using a, it as a tool. A tool yeah. like anything mm. else. But if you start letting it go away on its own and then try and badge up what you've done as legitimate product, that's a bad thing. You mean you're referring to when it's been um, <clears throat> trained? In inverted commas by actual not artists necessarily it's just by, where, by humans where we're being where folk are being disingenuous with it if they're going to announce quite publicly look we've written this rule book with AI because we're lazy fuckers, <laughs> then fine you know you've admitted what you're doing and you're carried on and done it fine but don't try and con us don't try and blag it as your own work or original or anything like that and that's the danger when tools like AI you know. That's how Skynet starts, right? <laughs> and Skynet's not a good thing. Well, I can't, you, you mentioned Terraform Mars earlier. I, I really like that um, there was an uproar against the latest Terraform Mars expansion because they're using AI art for the card art. Was it better? That's like, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, that's what I thought. <laughs> Because <laughs> the first game's just shitty clip art they could find for free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, the thing is, though, I mean, I, I don't disagree with anything that's been said here. I want to make that very clear now. I'm just going to throw in a grenade, just for thought more than anything else, and just think that, remember remember the 80s when we had Tomorrow's World, and many, many years ago you'd have robots and, you know, humans would never have to work again because of all of, all of this automation. Is this not a step in that direction? Computer, put on the music. Computer, draw me a picture of this. Computer, write me a symphony. Is that not along those lines that we've been aspiring to for the last 60 years since Star Trek was a thing? But even in Star Trek, they make their own music. You know, Picard's got his own flute. That's true. He's not He's getting, not getting the computer to write him a symphony. He's, or, or write Shakespeare, is he? He's still doing the old Shakespeare monologues in the holodeck. Fair. It's, it's a tool. It yeah. is a tool. I, mm. I don't think it's good or bad per se. I think it's it's how it's used and how it's applied can mm. create something that's good or bad. But I'm generally wary about anything called AI because it's not AI. It's a rule-based decision maker that's doing things very quickly. To go back to what Andy was saying, for game development, AI could be incredibly good. It would be great to see if that was... the you know, if that was developed and that was the case, to see more iterations, that games could be more stress-tested yes. before, they, before they get out. Mm. For like, <coughs> tapestry. <coughs> Sorry. 
Doesn't that just create different biases? Doesn't that just create... That's like, you know, picking your people that like your game to play your game. No, because AI, in theory, would be relatively neutral. The whole thing about but, a computer is you'd score certain outputs, basically how AI works at the moment is you get a score yeah. on certain outputs and the computer would automatically optimise that particular output. So if you found by some kind of statistical analysis that one particular outcome of the game was more common than the other, you'd probably change the design of the game ah, to make it less Ah, but that's no, not AI. No, it isn't, but that's the point. You're using the tool to give you the information so you can change the design of the game, and that's good. That's, that's Monte Carlo simulation, not AI. Well, it doesn't point. matter. Well, it, it, it's not a decision maker. It, it's, it's not making its own choices. Yeah, but but the, the, I think Andy's on about a hypothetical situation where AI could potentially. Yes, do that. exactly. That's ultimately where you would go with that. Uh, yeah. It would. Anyway. <laughs> ah, he's going there. Yes, yeah. he, it's going to stir it up now. This this is that. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's why I'm, that's why I'm quitting the show. Let's pick another question. <laughs> Moving swiftly uh, on. I think All King's Crown's a good one given how much you two have been playing games this year and how the fact you're paying a good mix of games. So Old King's Crown asks us, have you played any, ga any, played any games, old or new, that really surprised you so far this year? Hmm. That's an interesting question because being surprised by something can A, work both ways, mm -hmm. and B, it's different to having something good or bad because if you expected it to be good and it is good, it hasn't surprised you. Right, I'm going to surprise Andy. Ah! Starting to like terraforming Mars. <laughs> yeah, I've learned to it over the years. <laughs> the thing is, I've never said it was so, shit, and I still don't think it's shit. I just don't. I still don't think it's as good as people make out, and I maintain that. But I know what you mean. So we played. We played it as part of the BGG Top 100, and then it's now on Board Game Arena, and it's a really good Board Game Arena game. Yeah. Because it's because you can play a turn and come back to it half an hour later and see if someone else has played a turn. Mm. It's and it's growing on me. I think it's because. I think the first third of the game is boring. Mm. Is it with Prologue? No, no, it's just is box, it? It's just the standard oh, that's interesting game, yeah. because Prologue, the one of the expansions, does accelerate the start of the game, yeah. and it does make it better. So yes, I think that's part of the problem with it. Mm. Anyway, yeah, so that has been a surprise that I've actually now I've played it a bit more. I actually like Terraforming Mars more than what we made out on here. So there is a listener that did complain last time we complained about Terraforming <laughs> Mars, so I, they, I do owe them an apology. But other than what else is surprise? No, we played a lot of games in the top 100s that we'd not played before, Rory. Is there anything in the, that I you haven't we, played I think we searched this when we did a recap, but my biggest surprise has been Great Western Trail. And it was well, a surprise like because yeah. I don't like Gresswood. Didn't Haven't liked yeah. playing it so far. Wow. I think it's... I think there is more to that game, um, but I just get I've just gotten bored and frustrated with losing continually, with and I don't seem to be getting any better at it. I don't seem to be learning, and I think I find that a frustration. And I thought, given how much good press that gets, I thought I would like it, but it just hasn't mm. it hasn't clicked with me at all. I've got one that surprised me about you, Rory. Oh. In the last episode, we talked about Cthulhu Death May Die yeah. and how you didn't like that because it was a dice fest. Yeah. And we also mentioned that we went back to Aliens Glorious Day in the Core, yeah. which you didn't like because it was a dice fest. There's a theme here. <laughs> I was really surprised how much you loved the dice fest that is Kingdom Death Monster. That... Is yeah, but because... that's because he's wrong about the other two games, because he's an idiot. <laughs> no. We've explained this already. No, it's because <laughs> Kingdom Death Monster has a narrative. It has. I'm telling a story. I'm getting invested in that story that I'm telling with Kingdom Death Monster. No, with, it doesn't. With Maron, the one-handed lion slayer. It's like, nah, I, I nah, I'm not having, I'm not having this. I'm not having... You make up the story in Kingdom Death Monster. Yes, but that's part of the game is that you're making up a story, that you're telling it, that you're exploring this world and you're, you're emotion. I was emotionally invested in these characters. The fact that I can remember the first character's name and we played this four months ago. Yeah. Can, yeah. Can you remember your character's name in Kingdom Death? Yeah, no, so no, no, sorry. Not the sorry, Kingdom Death, sorry, from Cthulhu Death May Die. Can you remember the name of your character from Cthulhu Death May Die? No. Yeah, there we go. Death Mother, I, <laughs> you're not wrong about that aspect of it. I mean, but I think Kingdom Death is 
a far more interesting game if everybody around the table commits to it, like you said, Rory. But I think for me, I I, I love games that tell a story. So we talked about this at the end of the end at the end of last year's episode. Hegemony, I think, is a game that tells a story. It's although it's quite a dry Euro economic game. I think there is a narrative to it. How I mean, the, the, you know, Steve, the the government sold Steve, who's the court, the capitalist, the BBC, and you were able to just run amok. There's these moments in Hegemony and other and Kingdom Death Monster that have a narrative that create this more ex, this experience. Whereas Cthulhu Death May Die was just. I'm going to walk into that room and roll these dice and shoot that gribbly. What gribbly that is doesn't matter. It's a gribbly. So if we if we took the story away from Cthulhu Death May Die, you'd like it. No, no, because that's, that, that's all that Kingdom Death has done. Because Kingdom Death doesn't give you any hooks, doesn't give you any reason to tell a story, other than the fact that it's a damn good fun game to play that you can tell a story over. But there you, is nothing in, nothing in Kingdom Death that says tell a story. No, th- there is. There is. It comes with a storybook. It sets the stage for that. It gives you a storybook. It gives you these pictures. This is the journey you're about to go on. It says, what is the name of your character? What gender are they? It gives you these prompts to tell a story. It invites you in to do that. Cthulhu Death May Die was just like, here's Johnny Shotgun, and he's he's agoraphobic. Right? What choices have I had there? What have I done? I've just picked. I've just it's picked fair. Johnny Shotgun. Oh, well, no, I've just been given a random card. Oh, he's agoraphobic. Brilliant, right? And now, okay, so then we go into this room. What mission are we doing? Are oh, we going to stop someone reading books? Okay, cool. Where's a, where's the nearest book? The nearest book is there. I'll go to the nearest book. Oh, there's a gribbly. I'll shoot the gribbly. Even even the battles in Kingdom Death Monster are more interesting because there's tactics involved. Do we attack it from here? The flank? The, there's none of that in Kingdom Death Monster. In, in Cthulhu Death May Die. Gentlemen, I have to, to, to draw this discussion <laughs> to a close because I think I could leave you argue this all, all night, but I think our listeners would not appreciate that. Well, I don't know. Maybe they do. Maybe we do only do a Patreon and that could be the Patreon support, which is just... Here, here is Bicker. So, so, I, oh, sorry. I just instinctively went Andy and Sid arguing because it's usually Andy that's <laughs> argumentative, but it was Rory and Sid. I do apologise, Andy. <laughs> I'm the, co- I'm well, the common link well. of the chain here, haven't I? This is exactly yeah, this, this, I'm yeah, not coming out of this looking very well. One, yeah. I, anyway, I don't argue, thanks. Steve. I merely explain why you were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, folks, thank you very much for listening. We have been Polyhedron Collider. By the way, of course, this episode is sponsored by Kienda. Um, if you're going to buy a board game, and let's be fair, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably going to be buying a board game. Go to the link in the show notes and we'll get a juicy discount off your purchase. Um, also, we'd appreciate if you give us a review on your podcast platform of choice and do all the social media stuff, likes, comments. Rory's doing loads of videos, which we're putting on YouTube and Instagram, little funny videos. Give them a like, give them a comment. Just It, it all helps us grow. Um of course, we are on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, and the Board Game Geek Guild 2726. Until next time, happy gaming. Cheerio. Cheerio. Bye-bye.